Who has, who's never been to the business track, our business track? All right, so here's how this works. It's a little bit different. Business track, uh, we're going to have four speakers today, and this is not planned. Um, uh, Chris didn't prep anything, right? There's no slides. Um, I don't know what she's going to say. We haven't talked no beforehand. No one knows what we're going to say. Yeah, literally no one. And, and so um, I am here just to get the information that you want out of Chris's head. Um, and that's what this is about uh, for the next two hours. So there's going to be four presenters, four speakers, um, and we're just going to talk. And today there's a, a common theme. Uh, what we're going to talk about with all the four speakers is failure, and especially business failure, and what the takeaways were from, the, from that failure. Um, and again, all we're going to do is just chat. Um, and so if you have questions for Chris, this is interactive. Um, Chris and I are going to chat, but if, if you have something specifically that you want to ask Chris, um, let me know, and, and let's get that information out of her head. Can you do that? Sure. Is that good? Um, Chris and I have known each other for, for several years. We met at WordCamp San Francisco many, many years ago. Um, and this is somebody that I've just admired and, and respected for, for a long, long time. So uh, give a warm welcome for Chris Ford. Thank you. So Chris, do you want to start? Uh, do you have any, any, any stories that you can think of or anything you want to tell or, or examples of just times in business, because you've been doing this, you've been at this a long time. So uh, anything that you've maybe failed at that you want to share that oh, you've you, so that you... many things. <laughs> really? You? So I don't believe that. So many things. Um, I graduated from design school in 1996. It was coincidentally the same year that the commercial internet became a thing. Um, I started off as a print designer and got a job at a skateboard company. I was supposed to be designing t-shirts and their web guy quit and so guess who was their new web girl. Um, and so that was kind of the, where, I, where I started my path. I worked at agencies for about 10 years um, and that was really like one of the first big, not failures on my part, but failures on the dot-com economy. Um, where basically a bunch of us had been working at this great company. We were doing projects for like uh, this guy named Steve Wynn who was gonna open up a hotel called Le Rev that instead <laughs> he named after himself. Like it was a big, awesome, super fun agency working with super smart people and we showed up for work one day and the doors were locked. Oh. Yeah, and All they right. were like, so long, suckers. <laughs> um, you're not getting paid either. And so that's how I became a freelancer. Um, <laughs> and like, I, I would say like that was the first big disillusioning failure through no fault of my own, but just kind of realizing like sometimes in bubble economies, things happen and... Um, you've got to figure out how to bounce back from them. And mine was, okay, if I can't find a job because every dot-com is closing and you can pick up an Aeron chair on the street from all the dot-coms going out of business. Literally on the street. Literally on the street. <laughs> like, because I don't know if anyone was around at that time, but they were like hiring people and paying them $100,000 a year to sit in a chair and not code, just so when people came through, it looked like you had a really big agency. And so, like, people were just throwing money around, uh, foosball tables, free soda. It was awesome when you were 27. Like, it was the best job in the world until you realized they'd spent all the money on foosball tables and catered lunches and free sodas, and you didn't get a paycheck, and the door was locked when you showed up for work. So I, I know you're continuing the story. I want to share something along those lines uh, really quick. I was in L.A. at the time, so I was in Santa Monica, is where, is where we were located. And my buddy, uh, Bill Reaney, um, he, uh, he worked at a, at a large agency, like you were, like you were saying. He quit his six-figure job uh, to take half of his salary and go to work at eToys.com. He was uh, employee number six. Anybody know what eToys is? Remember eToys? So eToys led that dot-com failure. That was, the big, that was the first one that crashed. And so 
everybody around him, they were millionaires on paper. They all bought uh, Mercedes or leased Mercedes and, and expensive apartments in Santa Monica. And he had the exact same experience as you. He came in one day and the doors were, well, the doors weren't locked, but he came in one day and literally everybody was racing out the door with an Aeron chair uh, on their back. <laughs> So that's what made me think of that when, uh, when you said that's that. That's how I got my first one gig hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> it was, like, we were like, our, when we went back in to collect our personal things, everyone was like, this is my personal thing, this is my personal <laughs> thing. That's about how much my paycheck was. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, go on with your story. Um, and yeah, so, so like the lesson I learned from that is the biggest thing about failure is learning to be resilient and bounce back from it. Um, I was really bothered by it, like it really affected me. I, I took it really personally. Um, and it was just an opportunity that I didn't know was an opportunity yet. Um, because I went on to freelance for 13 years um, under a variety of names as, you know, I decided the last one was really, really dumb. Um, and so it, it took me to places I never knew that I could go by myself. Got it. All right. You know, you strike me, you've always struck me as somebody who's got uh, uh, moxie, grit, um, um, gumption. You pick a word, right? And, but that's what it, that, I think that, that it takes some of that to go through what you went through right, and, and bounce back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you just have to, there's this, does everyone know who Brene Brown is? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I would join that woman's cult. Um, that's when I came up with, I would join that woman's cult. <laughs> tell me, um, for those who don't know, tell me. She who, is a shame and vulnerability researcher, which sounds like a really horrible thing to read books about. But she wrote this book called Rising Strong, and it's all about people who are resilient versus people who aren't. Um, and I mean, I've been knocked down so many times that, that sometimes I wonder how I kept getting back up. Sure. Um, and it's just, what's, what's the alternate? Um, my dad and my mom were divorced when I was about 16 years old. And to the end of his life, he was still bitter about it and angry about it and kind of never got over what happened. And it just kind of struck me like, I don't want to live my life as someone who takes this one thing that happened to him 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago and lets it control their life. Like, that's not the person I want to be. And so I think cultivating, you know, reading about how to be more resilient and bounce back from those things like, that's the biggest lesson of failure is no matter how many times you get kicked in the teeth, get back up, you know? The only other option is to lay down, and you don't get anywhere when you do that. Well, and I think something else we have in common is my parents were divorced at five, right? And I think um, you know, the, the people that I know that came from uh, d divorced parents have a certain independence, right? They are able to kind of... Um, figure things out on their own, you know, be on their own, be comfortable on their own, right? because it's part of, part of your upbringing. Do you, yeah. you feel like you have that, that same Yeah, well, sense? and I was 16, and my parents were both like, woohoo, they got married when they were like 17, 18 years old, so they went off to live their life, so I just kind of went feral at 16, which, you know, is not a really good time for a kid to be without supervision. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was, you're, you're absolutely right. Like you have to learn to figure things out. Um, on my 18th birthday, my dad was like, here's the want ads, find yourself an apartment. Um, and so it was, it was like, just kind of like, I have to figure it out because there's no real safety net there. Like there is no, there is no lay down because there's really no one to come up behind you and pick you up. Got it, all right. I'm going to keep going unless anybody's got... Yes, Sam has a question for Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Sam.
suggest. Um, So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to repeat, kind of repeat the question for the for the for the uh, for the video, right? So the, um, I'm going to paraphrase because it was really well spoken, and I'm not going to be that well spoken. Um, um, but um, what do, what do you do, right? Once 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 you've experienced that failure or you've been knocked down, right? What do you what do you do in the short term to pick yourself back up? Well, like the first week, I cry and beat myself up and tell myself how terrible I am and worthless <laughs> I am. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm, yeah. I spend a good solid week. But what I do is I set a timeline. I'm like, okay, your pity party ends on Friday. You can go ahead and feel all these feelings for this week or day or depending on, like, the magnitude of the failure, how long I've, I've allowed myself and then I try to do, I don't know if everyone here knows, I'm pretty open about it, but about seven years ago, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which got me into therapy, which was awesome. And so I give myself that time, and then I get back into doing healthy things for myself. I don't wallow. I get back on a schedule, even if I don't feel like it. I force myself to get out of bed. I force myself to take a shower and get dressed. I force myself to restart Brene Brown books so that I can start, like, putting those positive words. She has this thing where she's talking about shame, and there's a difference between shame and, and I can't remember what the other one is off the top of my head, but shame is telling yourself that you're a bad person, and you're not a bad person, something bad happened to you. Um, and so those are the kind of things, like I rely on books and being around people who remind me that, no, you don't suck, um, and, and having a good support system, like having people around you who you trust to tell you when maybe, you know, you did something wrong to cause the failure and the lessons you can learn from it so that you know that they're not blowing smoke when they're telling you that, no, this, you're not worthless, you know, here's how great you are. Here are the things you accomplished, and here are here are the things that you can do with that now. It's interesting because uh, you, you took me a long time to um, embrace therapy as well, right? Uh, uh, you know, up until probably forty, yeah. I, I thought, okay, therapy's for losers, right? Ours was right? you don't share your dirty laundry Absol with other people, right? Like it's just. It was, it was part of my belief system until I started actually going, right? And it does help. One of the things that my, I take away, you said something interesting, right? You said it's not, it's, you know, it's not that um, you're a bad person, something bad happened to you. You might take that even a step further and say something happened to you, right, without putting a label of good or bad on it, right? This just, this thing happened, yeah. right? right? And it's another way of just relabeling and say, okay, now I'm going to move on to the next thing. So I thought I saw another hand. Okay. Um, one of the other things that you said, um, you know, because you've been doing this, you've been at this a long time, right? And you've been um, under many different labels. You know, you've had to reinvent yourself, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. What does that process look like for you? Um, so... I've had my skill set become obsolete during my career probably five times. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I coded <laughs> HTML. I started as a print designer. That was my education. And then I fell in love with the web because one of my professors was moving on to work at Wired Magazine, and he really encouraged me to get into it. He thought I'd enjoy it. Um, and so I started, you know, doing HTML with tables and spacer GIFs and frame sets and all of that. And then Flash came along, and that's what everyone did. That was awesome. <laughs> you know what? I was actually looking at a Flash archive, like the history of the web, and I miss, like, I don't miss the inaccessibility and stuff of Flash, but it was so fun. Oh, Like, oh, as absolutely. a designer, like, being able, it was almost like being in video and not the web. Yeah. I really, like, I enjoyed, that was one of my favorite parts of my career was doing that, because it was so creative. Um, and then Flash died. And I went back into print for a while. I was a professional scrapbooker for several years. Huh? I art directed a series of crafting books. 
I was the first openly gay scrapbooker, which caused a lot of kerfuffle back in like <laughs> 2000 whatever. Um, there were a lot of people who weren't too happy about that. At one point, a magazine accepted one of my submissions and called me back and said, we actually can't use it. The editors said that they can't put this in the magazine because it's a picture of you and your wife being affectionate. And we think that our audience would really be upset about that. And the last thing I ever had published in a magazine was in a June wedding issue of our marriage in Canada when it became legal. So it was kind of one of those things where, you know, I kind of broke down some barriers in there. And that was a Good. really interesting learning experience. Nice. Um, it didn't end well, but it was an interesting career. Um, we can talk about that one later. It's probably my biggest <laughs> career mistake. <laughs> So, at, at, at each of these, um, during each of these transitions, was it, was it conscious? Did you make a conscious decision, this is what I'm gonna do? Did you try, a bunch, did you throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what stuck? But how, how did it work for you? I was always kind of like looking ahead, like when I saw Flash coming out, I made it a point to learn it because I, I just had a gut feeling it was gonna be a big thing. So I've always just kind of looked at like, I get bored really easily. And so when I do something for a certain period of time and it becomes routine, I start looking around for something else to do. Um, so either looking ahead to what new technologies are coming out or I'm really bored and how do I not be bored? Um, and then some things have just been random opportunities. Like that whole scrapbooking thing, I had gone to a craft conference to go look at paper and, and hang out with one of my friends who was in the industry I met some random guy and we started talking about the difference between Charles Anderson and Charles T. Anderson, which if you're not a designer, he would not know about, but it was a very spirited, like hour long conversation. And a week later, I left my job making Rainbird timer demos in Flash, which was hellaciously boring. Rain, Rainbird, the like sprinkler, the sprinkler. system? Okay. Yeah, I would okay. like draw 3D things and like, animate them in Flash to show you how to program your sprinkler okay. for years. Wow. <laughs> um, and so it was just this random opportunity, like, hey, how would you like to, uh, our designer of this series of books is leaving, would you like to art direct him? And so it was just like, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, and it was actually at this time where we were transitioning to CSS, and I wasn't really comfortable with it, and this opportunity came along, so it was like, okay, I don't have to learn that, I know print, and it sounds interesting, so I just randomly picked a path. So yesterday you were giving a discussion about project management, right? About, yeah. about process, right? Do you find that of all these things that you've done, you've carried certain skills with you through all of them? Oh, totally. I, I was saying in the thing yesterday that my project management philosophy is I want to be the project manager that I wish I had when I was a designer or a, working for brands or, um, and a lot of what I've learned just working at agencies and working as a freelancer with clients doing project management and, um, a lot of the UX and UI skills I learned and like iterative thinking and all of that design thinking that, that everyone talks about, like I totally inform, I'm designing experiences for our clients right now. And so everything I do, I think about through the lens of my user experience brain, where it's like, how can I improve this experience? How can I iterate on it to make it better? And so I do that for both our clients and our internal team. Like they have a user experience on it too. So, um, Everything has definitely, like, in addition to the failures, but just, like, the hard skills I've learned over the course of the years have informed every new position I've taken. Cool. With questions? You're nailing it. <laughs> they have absolutely no questions for you. So, of all the client experiences that you've had, all the clients that you've dealt with over the, since 1996, Right? All of those interactions with internal clients and external clients, everything has always gone 100% perfect. Yeah, totally. Great. I'm right. awesome. Questions for Chris? No. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, actually, no, I, I, I was kidding. Give me one second. Give me, give me one second, Mike. So tell me about a, a project that, 
that, that you can remember, because I know there's the one, right, that just completely blew up, whether it was in your control or out of your control? Oh, God. So many. And you don't have to name names. That's weird. I can think about, like, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about terrible clients who would scream at me uh -huh. and, you know, terrible clients who wouldn't pay me. Um, and I'm like, oh, I, I was working on one project with a horrible project management system. I did not know what I was doing yet. Okay. Like, it was all spreadsheets and Google Docs, and I had binders with my information in it, nice. like that bad. Yeah. And, and it was beyond, like there were project management tools. I didn't have to have binders with printouts. Um, and everything went wrong, like bad client communication. And we would scream at each other on the phone. Like he would literally call oh, you me and the up. Like, you and the client. Huh? The client would call me up and just like verbally abuse me. And apparently he did it to his employees too and, and none of us really talked about it, but just not a very nice guy. And it was just the most horrible experience, missed deadlines. Um, there was another project I worked on one time at an agency that through no fault of our own didn't launch for three years. I only three worked years. there for a year. Wow. Yeah. I worked there for a year, I did all the design, and like every six months I'd check in, I'm like, I wonder if that thing's gone live yet. And three years later, the same design, which was totally outdated, finally went up. And I was like, I'm so glad I didn't stay and work on that for three years. Wow, that's some good I stuff. I think that's like the longest one that ever, ever went on. That's some serious slippage, Mike. So my question for you. So over, over the years, as you've been working for agencies, but also working freelance by yourself, as you're changing your skill set and changing things around, do you find that when you're working as a freelancer, that you know the the um, the freedom that comes with that and the flexibility versus the um, the stability of working with an agency, do you kind of go back and forth between those? Of like, oh, yeah, I kind of miss that flexibility and start to lean more one way or the other. Or you know, like, what do you what do you feel about that? And as a follow up, is there stability working for an agency? There is definitely more stability working for an agency. Okay. Uh, health insurance is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Vacations that someone like pays you for are awesome. Um, I'm really, really fortunate. About four years ago, I think it was that long, my friend Chris called me up and he said, um, I want to talk to you about something. Don't hang up the phone. <laughs> Which is always a great way to start That's a conversation. That's how he starts all of our conversations, too. <laughs> Please don't hang up on me. And I was like, okay. And he said, an opportunity has come up. It is totally not what you do, but I think you'd be really good at it. Would you like to come and be a project manager at Crowd Favorite? And so I said, yeah. You know, I, I had kind of gotten to a point where I felt like I had gone as far as I could as a freelancer, like there was kind of a cap on the projects I could take unless I wanted to become my own agency. Um, I am very not, like, I'm not really good at forcing myself to do things. I'm the person who as a freelancer is like, let's go to Target this afternoon, that sounds fun. And then I stay up till four o'clock in the morning catching up on work, so I was really burned out on just the constant grind. And so I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds like fun if it, you know, isn't a fit, it isn't a fit. So I went and got a crash course in project management. And after about a year, I was like, well, I don't know, man, freelance, like maybe I should give it one more shot. Like I was, I was having this crisis where I, being a designer, I felt like wasn't my job. It was really a core part of who I am. Like that was a really important part of me. That's how I self-identified. And so I was like, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready to give that up entirely. Like, I feel like maybe I should give it another shot and see if it's going to work out. And it didn't. <laughs> and um, I was doing support for a tool called Design Palette Pro. I started my WordPress career off um, 
building Genesis themes. While it was studio, first it was Revolution, and then it was Studio Press, and then Genesis came out. So I did the earliest kind of female-focused uh, theme there. And so there was an opportunity to do some support. It was some steady work, which was nice. It filled in the freelance gaps. And then uh, the two partners, Josh and Andrew Norcross, Josh Eaton and Andrew Norcross, uh, Lemus stole Norcross away. And um, no, he gave uh, Andrew a great opportunity, and he's super happy there. No, it's, cool. it's a like great it for, thing. I like, I like the way you described it the first and, time around. Um, <laughs> They needed a project manager because they were starting to grow, yeah. and I had randomly made a comment in Slack about project management earlier in the day, like, no idea why. It was just like, well, have you tried this tool? And Josh was like, oh, hey, you actually have a background in this. Would you be interested in coming on? And because it's a fully distributed company, I, I am one of the very, very fortunate people who has a full-time job with a great team. Everyone's worked there. Like, we've had no one leave in the two years I've been there, so it's a really tight, cohesive team. We all love working together. Like, everyone there is great. And, and so if you can find something like that, like, I find that when I'm accountable to people other than myself, I'm much more disciplined. Like, it's much... It's much harder for me to blow something off when someone else is waiting on it. I don't like disappointing people. So it's great for me. Like, it's a good structure for me to stay disciplined and get things done. And um, But it's really, like, what works for you. I personally, I could never commute again. Like, the idea of having to get in a car and spend 45 minutes going someplace Ugh. to talk to people on Slack all day, I just... I can't do it. Yeah. Well, I think we'll end there. Thank you very much. Oh, Big awesome. round of applause for Chris Ford. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>